Is it fashion or does it have a function? Oi, oi, oi. If I can move this a little bit. <laughs> okay, I assume. I'm both psychologist and archaeologist, and that affects whatever I do in archaeology. I don't know if you've been to, to Italy, to Pompeii, any of you. Many of you have, I assume. I just have to look at when we are starting. And I'm just showing you here. Uh, this is stretching out a little bit, the whole thing. That is the computer, that's not me. Uh, this is Italy, that's Pompeii, and Villa of the Mysteries. Some of you have been there? Yes, some of you have. It's a located a little bit outside Pompeii proper. This is what the villa looks like today, and uh, the fresco is located here. And the fresco covers the whole room of a triclinium, a dining room, and is probably the most famous and perhaps one of the best preserved uh, frescoes, fresco sites from antiquity. And I think you could fill this room with books and papers have been written about it. Uh, it is located in this room. This is an old Austin villa. Uh, it was looked like that originally, and then like this. And this is in a very remote, uh, the triclinium is in a very remote area of the house, which could be important for the interpretation. Anyway, this is approximate, approximately what it might have looked like in antiquity. It's not a very big room, a triclinium with three uh, cleaners, of course. And this is a me, just to show you that I've been there. But, but it's also for size. And I've read some interpretations where it's very evident that the person has only looked at the copies and not at you know, the original things. And there are things about the data that you have to collect it there. It covers the whole room, as you can see. This is the main entrance. And then there's a little door there to the side. And I will show you or freshen up your memory of what it looks like. This is the northern wall. Also northern wall. There's a lot of things going on here. This is the eastern wall. Is this too fast for you? No. Southern wall. In between there, there's a window, the white stripe. Um, and this is the western wall. And between there, there is a door. It's like that. So you see this little coupe is there, and this woman is seated there, and this is the main entrance. Now, the special thing about this is that it seems to be a cycle. It is something about the same thing. It's not different stories on different walls. I have, I have written a thesis about 550 pages about this, so you know, I could talk for the rest of the week. But I will try not to have too many digressions. <laughs> yes, good, good. <laughs> when we come to Wednesday next week, we, we'll have lunch. Okay, there are different classes of interpretation. One is religious, some are non-religious, then there are mixtures of that, a lot of bridal preparations and all that kind of thing, and then you have miscellaneous even almost sexual things. So there are many different interpretations, and people use different classes of data to base their interpretations on. Some of them use the composition of the fresco, that the sim symbolic things in the numerous of the persons and so on. Uh, some about Dionysian mythology and, and rites, because Dionysus is definitely there in the middle center, not the more main axis of the room. And then you have parallels to other works of art, but there is no other copy. And this is very special, because a lot of Roman Pompeian painting has copies. Uh, and then there are contextual factors. Are oh, they growing wine? So this is about wine production. Uh, and then the behaviors, and that is difficult, because it's very unclear what they are doing. And then objects of the press, or the mirrors, or the parallels, there, are those, and various things. But nobody has looked into the textiles until I came along. <laughs> and the costumes, the clothes, the garments, the costumes, whatever you would like to call it. And I think that is very strange because clothes have a lot of semiotic properties. They tell you who, what, why, where, age, position, role, the function of the person, uniforms, they can be functional or just practical. And then you have symbolic clothes, ceremonial clothes, I mean, if you see a priest, you can immediately say he's a Catholic priest or a Lutheran priest or he's a Buddhist priest or whatever. It tells you something. So if it is religious, which a lot of people say, what do they hang their arguments on? Well, I think 
to look at the clothes is a good idea. Of course, because it's my idea, so that's <laughs> I think this is my idea. The characteristic of cultic costumes is that they are very often old-fashioned. It tells you the age of the cult. And they are foreign if the religion comes from another country. And symbolic. You have the colors, the patterns, accessories. accessories. For instance, Christian priests wear you know, the, the different times of year, different colors. And that's symbolic. And if they're uniformed and standardized, they're all the same. And they're different from the contemporary fashion, very often. So my, I have two research questions. Are the signs of the clothes in the fresco being cultic? And if so, what may that mean? The first one is rather easy to explain. Is it fashion or function if the clothes in the fresco have characteristics of cultic clothes? Then I say it, it's possible that the fresco shows or refers to cultic activities. And then religious interpretation is likely. And if so, do we find dress codes? Something that is repetitive and uniform and standardized. And can we then say something about the functions of the, those persons in the cult? That is a little bit more wishy-washy. The first one is easier to explain. These are my data. I won't bother you with that. But you can see I've been doing a proper job. Are there, are there any foreign or fashion, old fashioned clothes? Yes, there are two people here with definite Greek clothes. Many of the Greek clothes was, were parallel to, to the Roman clothes. So you can't really tell, but some of, some of them are very distinctly Greek. That is a chiton, which was old fashioned at the time when it was painted, around 40 to 60 BC. Old fashioned in Greek. And here is a woman with a pet blossom. Okay. So we have one sign, it's something old fashioned. Do we find repeated colors and color combinations? Do I speak too fast, by the way? No. I hate it when people talk slowly, particularly after lunch, because then I fall asleep. <laughs> so yes, I say. We have, after I left here, it's white with purple. White and purple, white and purple, white and purple. And she wears white, but she has a purple stola over her arm. This is repetitive. <coughs> then you have light purple, very light purple. There are very <coughs> restrictive limits of colors in this painting, which is very unusual for Roman painting. Usually they're very colorful. Here they're light purple, light purple. It isn't that easy to see because of the reproduction, but it is. I can assure you, it's light purple. And then you have. Uh, some people uh, with only purple and some fur, yeah, and and also some with, with only dark dark purple. And purple is special for for Dionysos because that's the color of wine, and 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 uh, purple was also the most expensive color. <coughs> and you have purple borders on yellow, and yellow was also an expensive color, at least the original. I mean, they made fake yellows and fake purples, but the original yellow of that was saffron, very expensive color. So here you, you have a combination of two of the most expensive colors. And it's purple with, it's, it's yellow, I mean, with purple stripe. She's got it. She has got it. She has got it. She is in the dark, so it doesn't show so well. She is dressing up in yellow with purple border, and she is dressed in it. And you have purple borders also on white. On some very particular persons. I'll tell you more about that. And there are two persons who seem to be about to wear yellow and purple because she is, something's happening to her. And here is a cloth of, of yellow and purple. It might be her, her next dress. That this is an initiation white. And after initiation, she will be wearing that. And she is dancing. And it's. A bit hard to tell if this is yellow with purple stripe or just uh, the shades, but it looks, it is, at least it is purple in the painting, if you look closely up with a torch. And there are also other textiles in yellow and purple. You can see this woman sitting on, on, on a stool with this kind, exactly the same kind of thing. And you find yellow and purple in other paintings that are also referring to Dionysos. I think this moon you know, rings bells, at least in my head. This is a nymph sitting with little baby Dionysos, purple and yellow. Uh, this is more obscure, it's more a theatrical or musical scene. 
this is also Dionysia to Presto. They are paying some homage to uh, Dionysos. And this is a Maynard dancing in purple and uh, yellow, also with Dionysiac theme. So I think this rings bells. So the colors in combination are four colors. It's yellow, it's purple, it's white, and it's clear white in combinations. Uh, the purple borders on yellow, five persons. Purple on clear white, three. Purple and white, four. Purple only, five. Light purple only, four. Yellow only. And now I t made a G square just on the color combinations to see if they were arbitrary or if there was a pattern. I mean, we can think and see and say, yes, there seemed to be something, but something about hard data and, <coughs> and numbers. So I made a G square here. I won't go too much into the detail. The number is 24 because there's some you can't tell. Um, I made two tests. One is uh, the most conservative when I say, well, I count only those that are absolutely bang, bang clear. It's no question if these combinations are there. And then you get a G square of 12.5. This, this is the p-value. It tells you that it's less than Three, uh, it's less than three out of hundred chance that they are arbitrary. It's ninety-eight percent certain that they have they are a particular combination that is not coincidental if you mix these colors. And if you if you use a less uh, conservative, you say it's ninety-eight percent. But you know whatever. 97 or 98 percent is pretty hard, hard data. So yes, at least the color combinations there are very special. So do we have indications of cultic costumes, old-fashioned and foreign? Yes, at least two costumes. Symbolic and semantic? Yes, probably the colors because you have this purple thing, and the combinations they are statistically significant, and they seem to be uniformed and standardized. Now, the question are, are they related to the function of the wearer? Now, are the semiotics there? This is more spectacular. We don't very, know very much about the secret um, uh, cults of Dionysos. The, um, uh, the, there were various secret cults and, and initiation cults, but we do have an, an inscription on this base in Rome. It's later than the painting, but still, they, um, uh, they seem to be, uh, I mean, there's something about religion that's very conservative. They tend to have the same kind of things going on for a long time. And so, okay, she gave me two minutes. There seem, from this list, there seem to be some functions or some roles that I, we can see in the fresco, as you see them here. And I will show you what I mean. The light purple, are they teachers or instructors? She seemed to be a teacher of him. This is Silenos, Silenos. He was the teacher of Dionysus. This is Dionysus. He was the teacher of mankind, he taught us culture and how to make wine. And she is instructing her on what she can see in the mirror. Seem to be instructors, teachers. Purple, border, and yellow. Could this be initiated persons with priestly functions? They are all involved in some kind of ritual behavior here with the palace uh, next to Dionysos and she is part of uh, this uh, kind of, uh, of sacrifice possibly. They are not making food. They have one little twig of herbs. <laughs> I mean, Romans wouldn't paint on, on the most people making food or, or preparing a bath, which has been suggested. This is something else. And she seemed to be a major person in the whole fresco overlooking the whole thing. It may be her who is finally dressed up in the symbolic colors. And then you have white with purple. Is it some kind of lower initial or somebody who is about to be initiated? Her, for instance. Here, she's one who seems to be kind of scared of what is going on in the center of the fresco. What about only purple? Can that also be some initiated lower official? At least you have some of these functions, somebody who are 
from this Stella in Rome, somebody who is dressed in, in skins, and uh, somebody who is reading and having, um, having a um, book scroll that could be read from. And here is somebody who is also holding a fusos. You can't see the whole thing, but she's holding a tirsos. And one of the functions of the, of the role is to be a tirsos bearer. And, whole, and person who is holding a torch and so on. So we find these names in the role of officials in, in this um, cult. They seem to be present here. So I hope I'm within time. My conclusion is yes, the fresco does contain cultic costumes and not fashion. And thank you for your time and attention.